Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and an a LePage faculty fellow at the A.D. Friedman School of Business at Tulane, and I just want a quilt. So today, we, I am so excited. Um, Pam Weeks has uh, agreed to chat with us. Um, I'm working on quilt history. She's going to talk to us about quilt history. She's awesome. She's a curator for the New England Quilt Museum. She's been here many times, and she is cool. So... Um, Here's where we're at. So people, uh, we took a poll, and people really wanted to, to understand quilt history, which is great. I'm super psyched cool. about that. Um, I think that's awesome. Um, but the other part is we're now, I've written about 120 pages of, the, like, the big book uh, yep. on quilting and copyright. And now we're to sort of why the project started, which is this incredible, rich public domain resource that is all these quilts and what we all, the sort of the common pool of materials um and so i'm really trying to understand now what this what quilting is from that perspective of history of what we all think we can use um where that comes from um and i thought we could record this and have it as part of a series um as we start to talk to others about um these things but i thought we could you've been such a good base for me from the beginning that i thought we could start to talk about sort of what is quilting and in, in, in sort of in the context of museums and history and just generally how should we understand quilts? Cool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you want to start okay. with so I'm going to ask history? you some really basic questions. So that's Good. if that works. Good. All right. So this is Pam Weeks, um, who is, um, I don't know, our guardian angel, um, who's amazing. Um, and we're starting again now to really understand um, the intersection of quilting and quilt history and who we are. Um, and so we're going to kind of do a deep dive on this and try to do maybe 15 to 20 interviews with the various people on understanding sort of who we are as um, our quilt history. So, Pam, tell me a little bit about, so in case people don't know you, who are you, Pam, and why are you so amazing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, why are you who you are? Like, how did you, who are you? And tell us a little bit. I know we know a little bit about you because you've been on the show before, but tell us a little bit about the journey, your journey, and, and, and who you are. Okay, probably, I may have the most eclectic journey of a lot of people who are in um, <clears throat> in the museum world and, and the quilt history world. Um, I have a background of a lot of family history. Um, my family was very interested in its genie in its genealogy. Our immigrants first came to the shore in 1659. So I had a great love of new England history, family history. Um, most of the women in my family are craftspeople. There were very few quilters in the 20th century. Um, but I took it up along with my aunt at the time of the bicentennial during the great craft revival. And even though I have had many careers um, in business and in the arts, uh, quilting was always there. It's always been my craft. There were years when I didn't do much at all. Um, There were years when I took it on with great passion. Um, Very proudly, I am a state juried member, which means you have to pass juries of your peers in the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. Uh, Another historic thing I love is the history of um, our state and support of the crafts. But I'm juried for both um, traditional quilts and art quilts. I worked for the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen for years and knew traditional craftspeople, knew um, artists who consider themselves craftspeople. It's where I got my exhibition experience working for the League. There's a small gallery there which I had um, something to do with with the exhibitions and supervised the annual crafts fair, which was all about getting the right people to, to get up the exhibits for the for the fine arts and crafts that went on. Um, but I do have a lot of business in my background, but quilting was always there. Um, my second most important job that got me where I am today, I was for year for eight years the executive director of ABC Quilts which was founded in Northwood, New Hampshire by two New Hampshire grandmothers 
who were challenged to do something about the AIDS babies who were left to the care of hospitals in the 1980s and early, uh, 1980s mostly. Ellen Algren and Anne White rose to that challenge and almost by accident became administrators, very talented ones, of a, an international nonprofit that made more than one million quilts for wow. babies born at risk. That's amazing. And in that part of my career, um, I traveled all over the country, met all kinds of people, and um, also fell in love with antique quilts after being an art quilter for a while, making traditional quilts. Couldn't afford them, so I had to learn how to reproduce them, which gives you an entirely different education if you're a nutcake like me and can't just understand why indigo or matter was possible, but have to go into the complete history of the dye and textile history. So I come from a lot of different places and sort of wove myself into a museum curator because of my love for history, but I'm also pretty good at figuring out what people want to see hanging on the walls of my museum. And I think I've touched everything, Elizabeth. Right. So, um, so you are the curator at the New England Quilt Museum. Tell me what that means. Tell us a little bit about the New England Quilt Museum and sort of what role do you think it plays? What role do museums play in our kind of quilt world at the moment? Got it. So the New England Quilt Museum was founded um, in actually the founding of it. The roots go back to the 1970s. A group of very um, active and fantastic women Amazing, I'll use your favorite word, amazing Mm -hmm. women, started the New England Quilt Guild in the 1970s. They held a series of fundraisers and in a board meeting by the mid-1980s had decided to found the New England Quilt Museum. They chose Lowell, Massachusetts because it's central to New England. And Lowell is also a really cool place because there's a national industrial historic park there that explains the Industrial Revolution. Um, We had our own building by 1993. We have more than a thousand members. We do eight to 12 exhibits per year. And we try to, um, our, our byline is to educate and inspire. So what I try to hang on our walls are extraordinary quilts that will either educate you about a particular topic And we are getting more and more into social justice and difficult topics to discuss like um, gun violence. Um, We're coming up with an, uh, there's an exhibit coming next year on the history of, of women's suffrage to just plain drop dead, gorgeous, traditional contemporary quilts. Very cool. And my job as curator uh, and and a curator's job will vary from, from facility to facility. At the New England Quilt Museum, my major role is to arrange the exhibits. Uh, I will either see an exhibit, for instance, you and I hang out at Houston every year. I go to see what exhibits might be good for my museum. Or I'll come up with an idea. Um, My favorite thing to do is what I call a time span exhibit, and I've done several now. Uh, We just deinstalled one on silk, And what I try to do is find very early examples of silk quilts and explain the history of silk in our craft right up to what Kim Lacey and Margaret Solomon Gunn and Beth Ann Nemish are doing as high-end art quilters um, working with silk. We had three quilts made of men's silk ties. We had some crazy quilts, and we had a French boutique from about 1860. So it was a... Cool exhibit, and the second part of my job is um, I'm officially um, in charge of the care of the collection. But we have a, an amazing woman, Laura Lane, who um, actually personally cares. She has that she has the the collection in her head, and she cares for it and arranges for its proper storage and and uh, uh, the recording of it in our in our database. Very cool. Okay, so oh, hold on. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so I'm a historian by training, so I like history, but I'm not very versed, oddly enough, on quilt history. So can we can we start from, like, I always sort of 
pull back to like the bigger sort of how do we understand like the bucket of like quilt history? Do you have a sense of like the time, like the you know what? Where the what are the big time spans on quilt history, or is there not such a thing? Forever, um, forever. So just think of needing to stay warm. So any climate that has cold temperatures, they're going to find that the really good ways to stay warm. Uh, weaving blankets, <clears throat> weaving fabric. Mm-hmm. And the more layers there are in your bed covering, the warmer you're going to be. So I would guess, you know, I've never really thought of it that way. So if you've got two pieces of woven cloth, what can we put between them that's going to make us even warmer? And how do we figure out how to hold those three layers together? That's basically a quilt. Right. So I'm trying to think. I've heard recently that some very early textiles were found in Russia that were three layers and quilted together. Um, I think the standard example that quilt historians would give you is there's a little Egyptian statue in some collection. And I like to jokingly say that, that the little statue seems to have one of those L.L. Bean hanging diamond jackets on. You can tell his coat is, his coat is quilted. So he's, <laughs> he's got a quilted textile on his back. Um, I think those are the, those are the earliest extant dates but honestly as as long as people could weave and layer stuff layer stuff between those woven layers there have to have been quilts and do you find that quilts like there's we're kind of as a society in the united states focused on the american quilt experience have you found in your experience that quilting is a worldwide phenomenon absolutely uh, when we first when i first started getting interested in quilt history there was some really bad history out there and lots of people li- still like to say that, that quilting is an American craft. Um, you can debate it from here till Sunday. Most quilt historians will agree that there is one thing about the craft that's American, and that would be um, that would be the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the repeated block on the surface of the quilt. I'm not sure that other cultures did that as early as we did. Um, Lots of cultures, there there are Chinese quilts, Japanese quilts, um, French quilts that are beautifully quilted out of gorgeous materials. Um, There might be some early, there are some early English patchwork quilts. I think the earliest dated is 1712. And people would certainly have been, you know, using patchwork to decorate their clothing earlier than that. But uh, but quilting is not an American craft. It's an international craft. Interesting. Okay. So let's, so how do you understand when you're studying, like, I guess the question is sort of how do we start to understand the quilt history? How, where do we begin? Um, and how do we understand like these, these periods of time? Are you, is there like, is it coinciding with kind of what's happening in the United States? Let's just stay, stick with the United States for now, like a pre-Civil War, like, is it matching sort of the big moments of our world, or is it on its own track? Um, one of the biggest misconceptions about early 19th century quilts is that they were made out of <clears throat> used clothing, and the patchwork was of necessity. Well, certainly some of that was going on, but without the major monster thing that happened in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and the explosion of the availability of cotton fabrics, we wouldn't have had the quilts made that we see from the 19th century. So interesting. I think we've talked about that before, like the yeah. importance of, um, we see that with like polka dots. Polka dots can't be made until like you can actually figure out how to industrially make them. Um, the price of fabric going down because of the ability to make fabric um, at a cheaper price, all of this contributes to not only like a whole bunch of things, but in for our purposes for quilting, right? And don't don't forget what what is becoming more and more talked about is our cheap cotton fabric was cheap in part because of the slave labor that produced the cotton. Right. So that has that has that cannot be forgotten anymore. It cannot right. be brushed over right. anymore. Okay, so do we do we see like? When you're looking at quilt patterns, and do you have like a pre-Civil War, then post-Civil War? Like, how are you dividing, or is it not dividing that way? So when I think of it, I think of quarter centuries. Okay. What, did, what did we see in the last quarter century of the 1700s? What's different about the first quarter century of the 1800s and the second quarter century and so on and so forth? 
And, you know, generally there were some early patchwork repeat block quilts in the late 1700s, generally more of wool than anything else. Um, There is an explosion in patchwork that coincides with the explosion of the availability of cotton fabric by 1830 and 40. Um, so yes, the, the first half of the 19th century pre 1850 is when more and more and more and more people were as our wise, but husbands love to say, why are you buying perfectly good fabric to cut it up and sew it back together again? Right. Well, it happened early, like crazy in the 1830s and forties. Now is, now this is my, I run my husband who does more more of this area than I do so, but I suspect that the rise of the printing press and magazines and all of that also spurs on the development of patterns and uh, newspapers and all that. Is that an important part of the history of quilting? Absolutely. And this is where you need Barbara Brackman because she knows it so much better than I. Um, But not so much before the Civil War. I have dug and dug and dug in, in... Godey's Ladies and Peterman's Magazine. And you don't see a lot of, there's, I have not seen a cotton patchwork pattern in those periodicals. That comes later in the century, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. What they do, what they do, the patchwork they do talk about is silk. Um, There's a very, what I use in my potholder, um, my block by block research is a Godey's Ladies book example from 1835, which Lynn Bassett tells me was actually reproduced from an earlier English periodical about um, having children practice their patchwork and making them into into kettle holders, which we think of now as pot holders. Um, but that that issue has what we would now call English paper piecing with with hexagon silk. In, in patchwork for reticules and for um, for a small f- small fancy table covers and stuff. So um, in this in this pre Civil War period, then are women mostly? I imagine women making uh, their own patterns up. Like, is there any continuity? Sort of, what does the the repeated block look like in that eighteen thirties eighteen forties period of time? Very simple. Nine patches, um, elongated patchwork that we also call um, Puss in the Corner, uh, the Economy Block, which is a square and a square, um, two patch quilts. Uh, um, I'm thinking of a, a early Connecticut quilt that, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's basically an economy patch, a square and a square. Um, so let's see, Irish Chain comes in 1830s and 40s. I'm trying to think of an earlier one than that. Um, and then the wool quilts are large, um, large patch. But now, so um, let's take this off line for a minute. Do you have Northern Comfort, uh, Lynn, Z- Lynn Bassett's book? No, should I get that? Yeah, you should. Okay. Um, it's early New England stuff. Cool. Um, and what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm thinking of some very early quilts that have a lot of, of maybe it's only 1840, though, with, you know, just buckets of tiny little pieces and a huge, huge quilt. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay, cool. So a simple quilts, and then I suspect the rise of newspapers, magazines, that's a the late, late 20th, 19th century thing, creates mm-hmm. then uh, a whole new thing. Right. And now just, again, off record a little bit, I have not investigated other early periodicals. Maybe somebody has. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I don't, re- I don't remember ever recalling anybody doing any research on early patterns for cotton patchwork. Interesting. Silk, Interesting. yes, but, but not, not cotton. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, and I don't care if people, I, it's, I'm just admitting what I don't know. I guess yeah. it's, if you need to use it, go ahead. You're okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, okay, so what happened? So um, uh, okay, so uh, this is a really um, so I was watching. This is um, this is how I got here to this morning. So um, AccuQuilt Go had a, they're releasing a new um, set of dies. Um, they made a little video 
They said it was a um, a um, based on um, a, something from the Chicago Tribune. Um, of course, that sort of perked my interest. 1933. Is it still under copyright or not? They, it is. I mean, I don't think it is from my research. But you know, Na- is it Nancy Cabot? Um, so the, there's all these people and the Kansas City Star. Is it Kansas City Star? Like, there's all yeah. these like huge amount of patterns that are, like Chicago Tribune is putting a, a pattern like a, a block a day in there. Their magazine, their newspaper for a while. So tell me what's happened. Like, it seems like there's an explosion happening. I'm not sure when it starts, but of making people aware of um, different types of types of blocks. Again, this is where you need Barbara Breckman because she knows it much better than I do. But my basic understanding is the explosion happens in the 10 years after the Civil War. Um, More and more people are... um, more and more people are publishing. They're realizing the big market for for women, uh, women doing needlework. Uh, patterns are getting published for embroidery work, for for patchwork. And I'm trying to think. An interesting case was just written about in Blanket Statements, I think, Elizabeth, last time or the time before, about a publishing company in Port uh, Augusta, Maine. That ended up trying to that started out trying to be a general interest newspaper, but didn't get really successful until they switched to providing patterns for women's needlework, Very interesting. including patchwork. Paint. And this was eight seven eighteen seventies, and I think they finally folded in the nineteen thirties. Well, from my little bit of teeny bit of research this morning, what I thought was so interesting is um, these Nancy Cabot. She would every day uh, as part of the editor for the, uh, for the, I guess, embroidery or home editor or something, she would um, post a block and talk about it. And then if you wanted the pattern, you had to write to them and pay for the pattern. So like the Chicago Tribune was like a pattern company in some way, which I thought was mm-hmm. so bizarre that, that, that they're having people pay for these patterns. And I'm, I have no idea how much they were making. I mean, it, I just found it very, anyway, so that was sort of this research from just, you know, I, right. uh, I, I so it's all over the place. Also, the um, the kind of lore we hear is um, fabric on what is it? The fabric that's on the um, feed sacks. How, what, yes. what, so what's that about? So that's not lore. Um, another excellent presentation at an American quilt study group. I think it's in uncoverings from five or six years ago. A woman did a research paper. I think it's called the Bemis Cotton Company. And they and other, I believe there were other cotton companies as well, um, began to print their chicken feed, their flour, their sugar sacks, officially called textile bags, with cotton prints that would be popular for dressmaking or for quilt making. And they did it as a marketing scheme because if you bought your sugar in the bag with the blue polka dots this week, you need more blue polka dot fabric to finish that apron or to use in your quilt. So you're going to buy their brand in that bag the next time you go to the store. Um, And it became hugely popular, but also during the depression there, um, I've, I've spoken to women whose mothers couldn't afford to buy the fabric for their underwear and they made their underpants from feed sack fabric. And what gets tangled up is that um, somebody will look at a quilt and say, oh, that's feed feed sack fabric. Well, they also marketed that fabric on the bolt for the the dry goods store. And um, it's just a it's a tiny little stupid nudgy thing. But you can't really tell that you're looking at true feed sack fabric. Unless the piece of patchwork has the evidence of where the string was taken out of the top of the bag. Interesting. Otherwise, it's feed sack like fabric. And the, p- people think that it's always coarsely woven, uh-huh. but I've seen sugar sacks that were be- as, as, as fine as a, a good English lawn, a very tight, tightly woven. Interesting. And what fabric. period of time is the feed sack stuff happening? Um. The rage was, I believe, in the 1920s and 30s. Interesting. And And is, so it seems like this period of time, the 20s and 30s, there is a huge revival of quilting going on. There's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. There is. So go to Marie Webster. Okay. Um, Marie Webster, and I believe it was the first time quilts were presented in color in a woman's magazine, January. 
Ladies Home Journal, 1911. Um, and I was just reading up about Marie Webster, but some of that's gone out of my head. She was designing quilts and making them. An editor saw her work and asked her to present four new designs for that January issue. And they're very modern looking. They'd make any modern quilter happy today. A lot of, lot of negative space, um, beautiful revamped floral designs in lovely pastel colors popular at the time. And that just really opened the floodgates for more and more women designers to start publishing. Very interesting. So very interesting. Um, and then, so we've get, so we're now in this kind of, kind of the first, like, like because of the patterns and the fabric and, and newspapers and, uh, and, uh, we get this kind of explosion of, of stuff. So tell me a little bit about what is Kansas city star doing and why are they important to the story? You know what? That's one of my big weak areas. That's Ask and I think Ask didn't Barbara, Barbara just <laughs> and I think Barbara just uh, published a book on it. I just ordered that book. So yep, and, um, and it's not her first one. Um, she's written others about them. About that too. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll hold off on that. So so we get this like lots of patterns and lots of fabric and lots of stuff and stuff's happening. Um, how do you feel about those quilts from the twenties and thirties in terms of like museum pieces or how should we think about that era? of quilting they're absolutely gorgeous um they are they are beautiful modern design um some of the ones that were made in the midwest and we don't see very many of them in new england are the biggest weakness in the new england quilt museum collection is quilts of this period we only have three or four i think we have one marie webster we might have a couple of ruby mckims um Beyond that, we have um, Marion Cheever Whiteside Newton came along in the 1950s. We have a couple of hers. She was New England. But the ones I've seen some at the American Quilt Study Group seminars offered for sale made in the Midwest that are just gorgeous. Beautiful hand applique, beautifully designed, and, and then just extraordinary quilting. Just beautiful, beautiful pieces. And tell us who Ruby McKim was. Uh, Ruby is, McKim is, is or was. Was. Is she still was. Was. She no, she was. Um, she was a. I believe she had formal art training. Again, um, I'm just. I've been in the 19th century so long in my yeah. head that I'm just coming up to speed on the 20th century. Right. She was her, one of her first gigs was to design a series of embroidery patterns for children's quilts, based on the characters of Thornton Burgess Wilder. Mm-hmm. Um, who's who? Uh, what if, I can't think of the um, he it was a, a Reddy Fox and Johnny Woodchuck, Johnny Woodchuck, and um, they were they were they were forest animals who had advent, they were made into people and had <laughs> okay in the world. Um, and she did, and they um, were, were very popular. I'm not don't not remembering which newspaper they were published in. But this was another serial set of patterns published in a newspaper. And then she went on to design some um, very successful series of state flowers and state birds. And uh, she did, I believe, she did some circus animals and some Cupid doll-like um, figures. And then she also had her own, uh, Marie Webster had her own pattern company, as did Ruby McKim. They were very successful women entrepreneurs. And then at the time of the um, Depression, Ruby McKim sort of got, dropped the quilting and started uh, the McKim or Kim doll and, and had the second major life success in commercial doll making. How interesting. She was a very interesting character. Another Midwestern woman. Very interesting. Okay, so then what happens? So, um, oh, so going back, so then we've got the 40s, war, 50s, 60s. Is there a decline in quilting during this period of time? Am I right about that? Or is that a misnomer? It's in New England, yeah. There's a general decline as more... um, more women are interested in working. Um, there's there's a lot of handwork going on. I'm trying to think. My grandmother was a farm wife. My mother was uh, chose to work. She worked. She was she was the the accountant for my father's business. 
but my mother was doing embroidery. My grandmother was, um, knit my, and my, my mother was knitting. My grandmother was braiding rugs. There weren't any quilters except for my father's sister's mother-in-law was quilting in New England. So there was, yeah, a general decline. And then it all turned around at the time of the bicentennial when all of us 20 somethings started doing everything from macrame. Well, it, plus there was the hippie movement, the back to the earth movement and a general interest then, um, in 1968, I think I started accepting Mother Earth, what was it, the Mother Earth catalog, the Whole Earth catalog, or whatever the thing was, I'm, I'm forgetting it, but it was about handcraft and going back to the old ways, learning how to garden and live off the land, and a general concern for the earth, and being more aware of the resources that you were using, which I wish we would start paying attention to again now, but that's a different story. Um, yeah, but so the the craft, the whole craft revival peaked or was um, fired by the interest in the old ways at the time of the bicentennial. Very interesting, right? And then we get the rise of commercialism and all kinds of stuff. Although I would say it's um, it's kind of our hyper capitalist consumerism of today. It seems like it still had a commercial element to it, even in the 20, you know, with the fabric and the patterns and all of that, there's still, it's not like it's like, Oh, it's just commercial now. Right. No, no, no. In fact, um, I want to go back and stress the commercial success of Marie Webster and Ruby McKim. And um, where did I just read it? Oh, Barbara Brackman's latest post about a very successful Kentucky woman who was designing, um, boudoir fashions and appeared in several Hollywood movies and she was fulfilling um, orders for silk and silk like bedroom sets from I think Barbara Barbara put it from Saks Fifth Avenue to um, well Rodeo Drive I don't think was going on in the 1930s but from New York to Los Angeles yeah high end silk hand quilted hand produced um bed coverings and boudoir items and this woman employed more than a thousand people at one time amazing all right so i want to sort of switch gears as this first i think i may have to come back to you as i learn stuff to see what you think you think about what i'm learning but it also seems like um on the repeated block like talk to me a little bit about antiques like and like reproducing antique quilts and sort of what you think the sort of custom of the quilting industry is in terms of like when is a when is it a block, and when is it a quilt that you can't that is protected and nobody else can do it? Does that make sense? Like where's that? When is a quilt copyrightable? I guess is the question, right? So we can answer that if you can define what's completely original, right? Um, and, I'm, so I'm I'm going in through an inventory in my head. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm going back to uh, Deb Cooney is a member of the American Quilt Study Group, and she's just done with some um, other people massive amount of work on the 1830s, 40s, and 50s um, fad called Baltimore Album Quilts. Mm, right, right. And she's identified some unique designers. If they were making those quilts today, those probably would be copyrightable, but... Many of those designs, you could argue, were based on theorem painting and and decorative painting and other craft that was going on at the time. Um, I think that you, now here we go, can you make a, let's, let's use a, let's use a basket design and you, you draw the basket the Mm -hmm. way nobody's ever drawn a basket for applique before and you add four roses and six daisies and leaves that are heart shaped. Yeah. You make it your pattern. Is that now copyrightable, even though you could say it could be attributed to the Baltimore album quilts from the 1840s. So I don't know. So here's here. Let's, let's take it into another realm. So if I, uh, let's take it into choreography. So what we know from copyright law is that if you create a new step, like Michael Jackson's moonwalking, Yep. He doesn't get protection of that step. He only gets protection of the selection, arrangement, and coordination of the dance that he puts together. So the building blocks are never protected. So even if you make something radically new, 
techniques are not protected, but some design that nobody's ever done before that's in a block, I think that it's a building block. And so even though you've come up with, somebody came up with all of this stuff, right? It didn't, it didn't just magically appear. Right. But I think that, I don't think you, I think they're building blocks. I think they're common shapes put together in a way that we all yeah. use. Right. And so I don't, I think your selection, arrangement, and coordination of that particular quilt is protected for whatever, you know, whatever level it would be protected. And that's yeah. a whole nother conversation. But I think that the blocks themselves are like dance steps, like a bu- yeah. sh- shuffle or a buffalo, you know, right. like something like that, that, that we have so, to think about it that way. So you take your nine, your nine blocks that you think you've designed, but everyone has pieces that have come before. Right. And you put them together in a particular way. Right. With, with a particular garland border per right. chance. So I think yeah. about um, Splendid yeah. Sampler, which is yeah. a very popular book right now, and Splendid Sampler 2. And we asked people to make a common block for our project, and we, I wanted to know what they thought a common block was. And some of them did those blocks in there. Now, I think that the, the copyright protection on that, on Pat Sloan's book, is for the book itself. I think maybe a couple of those are original and interesting and might be protected, uh-huh. but how are you going to enforce that? So, I mean, I think if there was a comp- competing person that put out a pattern and the company went after that pattern, people, that would be that. But I guess my question is, this is just a theoretical question. I think if we have building blocks, it's not like, well, the blocks came from the 20s, so now, but anything new is not. I don't mm-hmm. think that's a way to look at it. I think that if it is a building block, if it's something that is going to be common and everyone will use, then it's not protectable. But if it's got some sort of – the other side of it is like embroidery, like mm-hmm. embroidery designs and other things. Like when is it common and when is it protectable? Um, I think we kind of know when we see it, but I think it's a hard thing to define. You're right. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, so I'm really curious. Like, so now we've got this hodgepodge of probably 50 or 60 blocks that, and some of them have come from Splendid Sampler. And so the question now is are those in the public domain as much as the ones that are like, you know, the economy block, or do they have a different level of protection? And um, I'm not sure about it, truthfully. I mean, I think some of them, you know, some of the like little kitschy, like uh, uh, elephant on a whatever. Um, probably are protected, but uh, not... Oh, I just had know. one pop in my head. Mary Engelbright was a designer in the 80s. Oh, yeah, right. And yeah. her her ap- her little applique girls would be very copyrightable. Right. Because you look at that and you know that's her that's work. Right. It's very much so, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, right, there's something... I mean, you kind of know when it's somebody's work, right? There's something about it. And I know that's a really stupid definition, but when you look at the court cases, the courts do the same thing, right? So they're like, well, they're they're, they're like, do you have access to the original? And then they pull it apart and they're like, well, how much they, they do this little deep dive of like how much is in the public domain and then how much is like unique and how, how much is it the same as the other one? Mm -hmm. Um, So, right. I think if you took Mary Engelbright's work and tried to copy it, it would be a problem. Right. Yeah. But it's not a problem if you do another riff on Sunbonnet Sue. No. No. It's true. It's very true. So um, it's complicated. So um, <laughs> That's why you have your job, dear. I know. It's true. It's really true. And people are like, when is the book going to be done? I'm like, uh, there's a lot. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I've been working like a mad person for <laughs> four months and like you know you're writing a book my yeah. house is very clean um so that's part of it but um oh, that's hilarious. Uh, right I, we I'm cleaned out the, the shed I can't go upstairs and, and write until the kitchen is clean it's true we cleaned out the shed after eight years of living in this house and never touching anything in the shed it is clean <laughs> it is great <laughs> yeah so definitely if you're writing your house is immaculate um <laughs> right and so the garden. <laughs> and I just have to say that truthfully, on, on, on a note on that, it isn't just procrastinating. I think your brain needs time to rest. Oh and gosh, I think yes. that the physicalization and the sort of 
all of that, and also the purging and sort of getting stuff out of your life that's like kind of chaotic is yep. really part of the writing process. I don't think it's like, oh, I'm right, my the shed is clean because I'm procrastinating. Like okay. I wrote for four hours this, in one morning, and then I'm like, okay, I need to clean and like get, get rid of crap, right? So I, I think it's part of the writing. That's my thing. I think it's part of the writing process. I, it's absolutely true. I, I had a friend here. Um, my original book deadline was, was August 1st, and I had a friend contact me who I hadn't seen for 30 years. Can I come August 8, 9, and 10? And I said, sure, the book will be done, no problem. <laughs> well, the book wasn't done. I got a I got a five-week extension. It's now due the 5th of September. But those three days were so valuable. I had not been hiking all summer. I had not been canoeing all summer. Right. And I had to clean the house before she came. We had a blast, and I came back the next day and was so productive. Yeah. Um, but I just, I'm having, it's, it's a bad day today. I, yeah. I will get back to it, but um, I'm, I'm here. I'll be fine, but yeah. I'll, I'll get there. But I, you're absolutely right. There are just some things, the chaos has to go away before you can get back to it. Yeah. And yeah. I think you, and I, and I really do think it's this like brain rest. Yeah. Like, you know, when I was like writing my dissertation, I did not do that. And I got pretty sick when I was writing my dissertation. And oh. I think we need physicalization. We need that. Writing is really brutal on the body, I think. Oh, it is. It's no question. Right? It's really bizarre. Like, people don't understand. Like, they're like, oh, you're sitting and just writing in a chair. It's like, no, no, no. Some, for some reason, this is physically overwhelming my body. <laughs> so. It does. And it's, it takes, for me, it takes such concentration to stay in that chair yeah. and to write one more sentence and to get yeah. one more thought where it belongs. And and it's it's going back and forth. No, that's the wrong order. We'll just leave it there for now and get some more thoughts out and right. then go back and rearrange it. Yeah. But yep. I, I have days where I can write 500 words in an hour. Yeah. And I have days where 500 words takes me nine hours. Yeah. It just doesn't. It, it yeah. is. And it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I like it when I've written something and I forgot and then I find it. I'm like, oh, I already wrote that. That's so nice. <laughs> like, thank you, old self. <laughs> and so the other part of it that I find hilarious is... I wrote that. I know, That's really, right? It's really it, good. <laughs> it is so odd. I know it's really strange that once you write something and you let it go, like it really isn't you anymore. Like I don't know if other writers feel that way, but it's it is so not. It's got its own life, um, and it it's does. it's like a child, have, right? It's not you anymore. I had the privilege of an excellent, excellent high school in New Hampshire, um, and I had four years of excellent English teachers. And I don't use the word excellent lightly. I tested out of freshman English in college. That's how good my education was in high school. And I can hear Mrs. Strout's voice in my head when I write. And I just say, thank you, Mrs. Strout, for making sure I understand sentence structure, but go in way and leave me alone because you don't know anything about quilting. <laughs> <laughs> Go away now. <laughs> exactly. Now, do you know the author is Elizabeth Stroud? No. Tell me. She's a wonderful writer. And this is my my uh, my sophomore English teacher's daughter is now a, a New York Times bestselling author. Yeah. So I can try. <laughs> right. Totally. <laughs> going to be bestselling on New York Times about world history. But anyway. Totally. Anyway. Uh, okay, cool. Well, I think this gives me a really good place to start. So the last question is on when you're reproducing antique quilts, and we've talked about this in the context of people coming to the museum and, and, and creating patterns from uh, uh, objects you own, um, how do you look at the copyright on older things? Like, do you feel like it's anything old is like in the public domain and anybody can use it in any way that you want or yeah. – do you think there's yeah. limits or yeah. do the families control it? Like, what do you think about like old quilts? So I don't think you can control it. Um, and I've been, I've been going through this with, uh, with the permissions that I've been getting for this next book that I'm writing. Um, so many museums now just, just say, yeah, it's out of, co no, they, they, if they have taken the professional image, then there is a charge and you need to get their permission for the object in their collection to reproduce it in your book. But um, lots of other places just don't worry about it. And um, I'm trying to think what, what example came to mind. Um, I, I don't think we can. Now, now you've got me thinking again, though, about a particular couple of applique quilts in our 
collection that are they're made of different elements. They have patchwork blocks in the center, but very unusual applique patterns in the borders. But they're all 19th century. Um, I don't, th- A, we do not have the resources to chase people around who are reproducing our stuff. B, I don't think we would bother unless there was some real egregious use and a woman's figured out a way to make a million bucks off one of our antique quilt patterns. Yeah. Um, but I just don't think we, we, we don't have the time or the resources to worry about it. So interesting. Well, I know that from my little experience in the quilting world that a number of like people who do this are like, well, if I make a quilt pattern on that quilt, then it's mine and nobody else can do it. And it's like, yeah, no. like, no. like let's, oh. let, let's just back up. The reason you could do it is because it's in the public domain. And so just because you make it doesn't mean somebody else can, you know, like that, that's a very silly, that's very silly, you know, right. so. I don't know. People are silly. Well, I think this is a great start and I'm really, really psyched about this. And I will, um, I've ordered a bazillion books, uh, the ones that you have suggested. And, um, if you come up with others, let me know. Um, and we'll also put out a list of the books that, um, we're looking at if others want to read them too. Um, so so you, are you a member of AQSG, American Quilt Study Group? No, I need to do. Tell us about, tell me about AQSG. Q-S. American Quilt Study Group. The reason you need to is because even if you never attend a single seminar as yeah. a member, yeah. you will have access to the online publications. Yeah, I get it. Do you yeah. know, and I should also interview them. I've interviewed that. I would love for you to, they're in, are they in? They're in Lincoln. Lincoln, yeah. That's where the office is. I really want to, um, I don't know, what are you doing in the spring? I'm in sabbatical in the spring. We should take a trip. <laughs> Well, I'm going to Morocco with my cousin. You are. <laughs> yeah, but we should um, absolutely, absolutely should take a trip. We, uh, well, you know what? Meet me in Paducah at the beginning of April. What? Meet me in Paducah at the beginning of April. Yeah, I could do that. I'm going to Paducah next week because um, I have a conference in uh, in Nashville for my oh, yeah, regular job it. conference. And I, I thought, mean, like, you know. I, mean, I don't know anybody on staff anymore there. You don't at a, you don't in Paducah? So. No. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to email them and see, they have like all these current, like they have Tula Pink and who else, uh, Victoria Finley Wolf. And yeah. is it another one? Like very contemporary people as their, um, exhibits yeah. right now. Very popular. Right. Super popular. They went popular. It was super weird. Yeah. Three of them yeah. at one time. Well, Any, so anyway. Can, once we're off recording, I'll give you a little bit inside stuff. Okay, cool. Um, um, but, so, so American study group, um, I would love to interview them and I will join cause then I will get access to all their publications, which right. Really cause if great. you're, if you're really keen, especially, um, so somebody's just done something about Marie Webster. So, uh, no. Cool. Awesome. Um, I need to study. No, I need no, to no, do no, that. No. So you need, um, you need a joy forever, which is, uh, so what happened with Marie Webster is her granddaughter took over the copyright for those patterns. Right, right, right. And I think I've done a little research on this, right? They, um, didn't they re- redo her stuff? Didn't yep, they, they republish did. her and stuff? The books, are, the books are lovely. Yeah. The books are really well done. Cool. Um, a, so what I'm trying to think of is a lot of, so people think about AQSG as being like old quilt history, uh-huh. but the presentation on the Bemis feed sack company was one of the best I'd ever seen. Are, um, they, are you going to that this year? Isn't it I in go Lincoln? every year. You go every yeah. year. Okay. Well, we'll have to think about, uh, going it's like when is it though it's like it's over i think it's over columbus day weekend so september no end of uh, beginning of october October. let me look i, I just oh, october I just, 9th through the 13th yep i just cut up my schedule oh my god it's so hard because of market and like all these things but um, <sighs> tell me about it and i don't fly so getting to nebraska is a little bit challenging i have to yeah. say i get it yeah but, so back to Paducah in the spring. Yeah. I am um, going to be, so the, so Deeds Not Words, mm-hmm. the one about the art quilts about the 100th anniversary. Oh, right. Of Is that Paducah. happening in the spring? Oh, yeah. I'll meet it, you there. Yeah, let's opens, do that. It opens in Paducah. Yeah, and let's I do that. Think, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait ahead. a minute. Why am, I, why am I thinking it's in Houston this fall? i got to go back and look. Is it? I've got to go back and look. I don't know, but I'm, I think it, I'm, no, it's opening. It's opening in April in Paducah. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's do that. Awesome. Well, okay. Well, let's do lots of different adventures. It'll be good. 
All right. All right. Well, I'll have to see how to get to Lincoln from New Orleans. That would be the question. I would love to go to the study group. That would be amazing. But, you know, it's all, I, you know, this so, whole this thing I have to be right. here to teach. But just, just join for the resources because so okay. much of what you just asked me, uh, you can you can skim um, skim some of the, the, the back issues of uncoverings and find, you know, find great peer review papers on what's been done. Cool. Well, I think that's fantastic. All right. You're amazing. Thank you for this hour. I really do appreciate it. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.